Welcome to the OC24 podcast, where we've taken some of the best talks and discussions from this year's 24-hour conference on global organised crime, which showcases some of the most interesting research into organised crime around the world. This episode is called Organised Environmental Crimes. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a panel about organised environmental crimes. We are live on YouTube. I think we are all set to get started with this panel. My name is Yulia Zabulina. I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, City University of New York. And I will be chairing this panel today. We have three outstanding speakers with interest and expertise in organized environmental crimes. Willis Okumu will start this panel delivering a presentation on the trafficking of sandalwood in Kenya. In his talk, he will examine the networks of uh, non state and non state actors that facilitate the illicit trade of the East African sandalwood tree, resulting in significant environmental harm, deforestation within community forests in northern Kenya, and other negative consequences. Yunezo Juan will then present on the topic of waste crime, examining how dissident paramilitaries and organized criminal gangs have infiltrated legal businesses in post-agreement Northern Ireland by focusing on the example of the illegal Muboy Dam. The session will conclude with a presentation by Meredith Gore about place network investigations of sea cucumber trafficking in Mexico. So we have um, very different geographical regions covered here, Africa, Europe, and Central America. And we obviously have very different uh, vulnerable wildlife, which is sandalwood tree in the context of the first presentation that we have um, I guess, overall environment um, uh, that is harmed by waste-related crimes and then um, sea cucumber trafficking. Um, I'm very excited about uh, this panel and the presentations. So we will get started with the first presentation briefly. And before we do that, I would like to know that if you want to ask your questions, you can type them in the chat. And then there's also a function here uh, that's called Q&A. You can put your questions uh, there as well. Um, I can't guarantee that all the questions will be asked after individual panels. Our preferred option is to save all the questions until, until the end of this panel so that we could have questions slash discussion and exchange ideas um, and learn from, from each other. If you put your question in writing, uh, speakers feel free to respond right away. We can come back to the question to, uh, to go in depth if that's needed at the very end of this presentation. So I leave a very flexible um, question and answer format um, to the extent that it doesn't disturb the speakers. Um, each speaker will have about 15, um, from 15 to 17 minutes to to present what they have prepared for us today. And I guess um, if we don't have any more questions um, and we shouldn't, we have 28 participants. This is a nice audience. Um, um, so let's get started with the first speaker, Willis. Uh, the floor is yours. I already see your PowerPoint. Please get started. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, uh, as she has uh, basically introduced me, my name is Willis Okumu. <clears throat> I work for the Institute for Security Studies as a senior researcher uh, based here in Nairobi. So good morning, everyone. My, my uh, presentation today would uh, will just focus on sandalwood trafficking. Sandalwood is a tree that uh, is uh, found in, in many parts of the world, uh, but also native to, to East Africa. And uh, it is basically uh, being ever exploited over the last 20 years in this region uh, due to uh, the fact that it has in its roots and it, uh, the essential oils that are used for the manufacture of, of, uh, of, of perfumes and cosmetics. So uh, basically this would be my, my, the, the center of my presentation, focusing on the networks and actors that basically uh, oversee uh, the, this, this exploitation of this very valuable uh, cultural heritage of the East African region. Next please. So sandalwood tree uh, is uh, called uh, Osiris lanceolata in, in uh, scientific language, the East African sandalwood. 
and it's a, an evergreen shrub that grows mainly in rocky, uh, uh, rocky and semi-arid areas of Eastern Africa. Of course, sandalwood is also found in other parts of the world, Australia, India, and the Pacific. And majorly, it's a source of essential oils used in making perfumes. In East Africa, it grows up to about six meters tall, and it is found in, in, in also in very, very rocky, rocky places. It uh, takes about 40, 15 to 45 years to mature, and therefore uh, the harvesting and the overexploitation that has happened over the years is, is creating a lot of environmental harm uh, to, to the environment in this regard. And locally, it is known, uh, uh, you know, with several local names, and that that also shows that this is something that is very, very, uh, you know, common and 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 and, and local to, to many people in this in this in this region. In northern Kenya, uh, the Samburu people uh, use uh, sandalwood for a lot of treatment and a lot of as, as medicine for cold in children. Uh, among the people of eastern Kenya, it's also used uh, as, as as treatment for several ailments like tonsils, diarrhea, ulcers, and snake bite. And in, again, in southeastern Kenya, it's used, uh, you know, sandalwood leaves are used to make herbal tea and, 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 and its roots are also used to make uh, baskets that, that women use when they're going to the markets. But as I had already said earlier, uh, we noticed uh, about 20 years ago that uh, sandalwood in Kenya was being exploited at a very high rate. So uh, in 2005, for example, from April to December 2005, the Kenya Wildlife Services uh, arrested uh, uh, people with about 180,000 kilograms of sandalwood. What, was, what is interesting about this case is that uh, the, the total value in, in Kenya shillings was for, for 14.5 million, but out of which only 0 0.9 million was, was, would remain at the community. That shows the level of exploitation that, that, that has been going on. In, 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 in terms of, uh, you know, people from outside the community coming to, to harvest uh, sandalwood in this country. And in, as a result, in 2007, the then president, Mwai Kibaki, uh, issued a ban against uh, this uh, tree in order to protect it. And this ban was supposed to last for five years. And uh, as a result, we've had uh, several laws that have been developed over the years. One of them is the Wildlife Conservation Management Act of 2013. But as we, as we, as we can see that uh, in, in subsequent slides, that it does not, this has not stopped the trafficking of sandalwood. As recent as 2021 in May, we had 5.5 5 tons of, of sandalwood uh, being, being arrested in some parts of Kenya. So this study was basically done in the month of April and May uh, this year. And our focus was on sandalwood markets in, uh, in Uganda, Tanzania, mostly, but also with outlets markets in India. Uh, we did about 15 in-person semi-structured interviews in several parts of Kenya. We did five focus group uh, discussions in also several parts of Kenya, including the police, uh, staff from the Kenya Forest Services, staff from the Kenya Wildlife Services, uh, local chiefs, brokers, clearing agents, local women who are doing the chopping of sandalwood once is harvested, and also two uh, biographical interviews with, with, with the key people who are the brokers. The main research question, as already alluded, was, was, was on what networks and actors sustain the trafficking of, of East African sandalwood from Kenya? What are the networks and actors that facilitate uh, sandalwood uh, trafficking in Kenya? What are the routes? What are the nodes of sandalwood trafficking in Kenya? What is the scope of the market? our effective at conservation laws in stemming the trafficking, and what is the harm that, that this uh, sandalwood uh, trafficking has caused uh, to the environment and to the vegetation here in this, in, in this republic? And what, what would be the policy recommendations that we could uh, enact to be able to prevent uh, trafficking of sandalwood in Kenya? So to the findings, one, we noted that uh, uh, majority of uh, the network that propel the trafficking of sandalwood in this country it's actually controlled by women. And, and uh, in this case, uh, we had cases of women uh, basically approaching very senior police officers within the, these regions and offering bribes. So we realized that there's an association of women, uh, of very high middle-class women that have been trading on sandalwood for a very, very long time, and they control this trade. Uh, secondly, uh, in the sandalwood uh, trafficking network, there are people called brokers. And brokers are the point persons of these women. And brokers come from local communities. 
and they basically link uh, the, the standalone traffickers with local communities, but also link them with state embedded enablers within the uh, within the the protective agencies, including the Kenya Forest Services, the police, and the Kenya Wildlife Services. And the broker is also a very direct uh, representative of the, of the trafficker. And he recruits somebody who is called a technician. A technician is basically a quality assurance person, somebody with a very good knowledge on, 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 on differentiating which one, which, which sandalwood is male and which one is female. Somebody who can be able to identify the, uh, the sandalwood tree with better oil content. But also in the enabling process of, of the trafficking, we had chiefs who are government employees, we had uh, rangers who are also government employees, and we had community elders who actually provide uh, access, who are basically gatekeepers at the community level, and, and, and they basically uh, receive bribes so that to enable traffickers to access community forest. And also, uh, we are also noted that the traffickers have direct linkages with state actors. And, and this is why uh, sandalwood can be transported from, from the villages, from the community forest, all the way to Busia at the Kenya-Ugandan border, and all the way to the port of Mombasa. And lastly, we also noted that traffickers are very well organized. They have formed associations, support groups, peer support, that enable them to get out of, uh, of, of tricky situations when one of them is arrested. And that also enables them to raise fees for, for court cases when they have such uh, kind of, of cases. So this is basically a glimpse of, of, of the sandalwood tree. On, on, uh, on, on your left, you see uh, a, a sandalwood tree that is still in the forest, but it has been uh, basically cut li a little bit to, to, to see how uh, mature it's becoming and to see whether it has good oil content. But on the left, on the right, you see a, a site where uh, you know, a lot of harvesting has happened. And, and this, looks, this basically gives you a glimpse of what happens with the, the level of harm uh, of, on the environment that is going on there. So to the next one, uh, what are the uh, in, uh, networks and actors that, that we noticed there? Uh, sandalwood trafficking is basically enabled by state officers. And uh, in, in, in this part of, the, of, of Kenya, security agencies basically offer protection uh, and escort the harvested sandalwood out of their region. And this plays a very, very big role in, 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 the, in the success of, of the trafficking network. The trafficking network of Sandalwood uh, cannot take place without government support. And this is the illicit government support. So that means uh, the, the, the officers of government in these areas basically facilitate uh, traffickers, obviously, at a fee. And secondly, we also noted that uh, when Sandalwood leaves northern Kenya, it goes to Busia. And primarily it goes to Busia along the Kenya-Uganda border because up to 2019, there used to be a factory uh, on the other side in Tororo that basically processed sandalwood, uh, you know, and, and they did the packaging so that the sandalwood could come back to, to Busia again and go to Mombasa as Ugandan product. And that has established an illicit market in, 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 in Busia and also in, in, in Tororo that still exists today despite uh, the, 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 the fact that the factory is no longer functioning. So we have smugglers who basically operate along uh, Busia border, and they basically ferry sandalwood uh, using bicycles at a small fee. And, and lastly, we have uh, shipping, uh, uh, ship, shipping companies and licensing office at, at the port of Mombasa that also are receiving bribes to be able to uh, legalize the, the, the transportation and the loading of, of sandalwood into, into the containers. So a bit of the scope of the markets, uh, we noted that at the local level, one kilogram of sandalwood is sold at 100 shillings, which is basically $100. And the cost of transportation is normally about uh, $1,000 from, from, from the source to the Kenya-Ugandan border. The cost of smuggling to Uganda is about uh, 3,500 shillings, about $35. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, environmental laws, we realized that in Samburu County, uh, there are no bylaws that, that, that protect the environment, and this facilitates uh, sandalwood trafficking. We also noted that forest rangers basically offer protection to traffickers as opposed to the forest itself. And this is basically the network. The community is normally at the, at the lower level, 
And uh, at, at the middle level, you see uh, we have uh, the police, we have the forest officers, we have the technician, we have the lorry driver. But in the middle there, we have women buyers that basically facilitate uh, the, the transportation of sandalwood into the international markets. So what is the environmental harm? It leads to deforestation, loss of biodiversity, loss of cultural, cultural heritage, loss of intangible knowledge on how sandalwood is used at the local level, loss of traditional medicine because it's used to treat a lot of other ailments, and it also leads to loss of uh, raw material for milk preservation because most of these communities are pastoralist communities. So we have a, a number of recommendations. Uh, the key that I could point out here is that there is need to enact uh, community bylaws to protect the environment, but also a lot of community, but also enforcement of, of the current law, which is the Wildlife Conservation and Amendment Act, especially uh, Article 92. Yeah. I think uh, perhaps I'll leave it there and, and, and wait for, for further questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Willis. I'm impressed with how much of community research you, you, you conducted for this project. And, and obviously interviews is perhaps the only way to get such, such interviews and focus groups is the only way to get such uh, rich information. There's uh, definitely a lot of time spent on, on, um, on collecting uh, data. Uh, visible in this presentation, and I, we appreciate this uh, very much. Um, I don't have I don't have any immediate questions in in the chat, so um, we are going to proceed to the next uh, presentation scheduled today. Uh, we have Yunez um who will speak about waste crimes in uh, Ireland. I assume so. Please get started, and um, before you actually give your content uh, part of the presentation, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Yulian, for introducing me. Hello, everyone. My name is Jun So Huang. I'm a PhD student at Queen's University, Belfast. Um, I'm sorry, I am a bit ill today, but I'll do my best to uh, finish my presentation. So my presentation is about uh, neoliberal peace and institutional ecolo institutionalized ecological blindness an organized cr environment crime in post-agreement Northern Ireland, uh, lessons from the mobile illegal dumping case. Um, so basically, uh, to, pro to provide a background to the Northern Ireland conflict and the Northern Ireland, pe Northern Ireland peace process, uh, not, there has been a history of the troubles going on, although uh, the offic officially the troubles, uh, which, is re which refers to the NI conflict, has uh, ended in 1998, when the Good Friday Agreement was signed between uh, conflicting parties. So uh, before the troubles, uh, there was a partition in the island of Ireland, which divided the north and the south of uh, at north and the south parts of the island. And then Northern Ireland was created and the south became later became the Republic of Ireland. And then uh, there was a, in, an incident called Bloody Sunday, where the UK government intervened, uh, UK security forces intervened in a civil march organized by uh, Irish, mainly by Irish communities. And then at the same year, in the same year, Northern Ireland government was suspended and all responsibility was transferred to the UK government for governing the uh, conflicting area. And then there were, uh, there was, uh, there has been a, a movement of peace process led by uh, several peace deals and also uh, civil society campaigns. And then finally, uh, the NI government was restored in 1999 after the signing of the peace agreement in 1998. Uh, but there also has been, uh, it has been a bumpy road to promote peace in Northern Ireland. But what I'd like to focus on in this presentation is why uh, organized environment crime has affected Northern Ireland, even if the peace agreement was signed. Uh, so the troubles was basically about, uh, people would say the troubles was basically about the, about the territoriality of Northern Ireland. Who will govern the country? 
and uh, there is an issue of the Irish border uh, created by the partition in 1920. But here, environmentalists say the environment is also a victim of the troubles, and I would like to say it is also a victim of the post-conflict peace in Northern Ireland. So James Orr is, uh, is the head of the Friends of the Earth, Earth uh, Northern Ireland, and he said environment is the forgotten victim of Northern Ireland peace process. And that is, uh, that is because uh, political, the, main, the main political parties in the post-conflict in the post-conflict politics have uh, marginalized environmental issues, but they actually came to a consensus on neoliberal economic growth. Uh, as a way, as a strategy for post-conflict rec reconstruction in Northern Ireland, so they place the environment as at the at the let's say at the left side of one spectrum, and then they place economy at the opposite side of a spectrum. So they say, well, we have to uh, pursue economic growth. So at the that will be at the expense of uh, the environment to some extent. So. Uh, my research question here is that how organized environmental crime has permeated the Northern, Northern Ireland society before, during and after the peace process. So there, uh, there are lots of, uh, there are quite several cases of organized environmental crime, but I'd like to focus on uh, waste crime, which is reported as a very large scale and also very uh, impact impactful in Northern Ireland. And here, one of the representative cases of waste crime in Northern Ireland is the mobile illegal dump, uh, which was initially uh, found in 2007, but uh, law enforcement community did not uh, initiate a full investigation into it. And then it was later fully discovered in 2012. So uh, once it was uh, discovered, it was, uh, it was reported that 500,000 of tons of waste were buried or piled up like mountains, as you can see the uh, picture. Um, but then now, to date, it's 1.5 million tons of industrial and household waste, which were either shredded or just buried down uh, under the land. So uh, you can see the picture down um, uh, here. There is a map of the Mobile site, and it is, it is uh, very close to the River Fahan in Derry. Uh, which provides a drinking water source to people in Derry and also in Donegal across the Irish border. So the problem here is that uh, it's not just criminals uh, broke the rule and the law. They actually, uh, the owners of this mobile site ha actually had a license to process waste, but then they just illegally dumped or buried their waste because they could do so. Uh, here, uh, there was a government report, a, a, a report commissioned by the government, which said the Department of Environment does not have, appear to have a formal process of evaluating consequences of strategies and policies in terms of criminality. So uh, here, not only, uh, so licensed waste processors could uh, make profits uh, by illegal dumping rather than uh, complying with rules and regulations. So, and the government's, what the governmental uh, report says is that it's not just a, a case, one case of a criminal offense, but it shows systematic failures in preventing criminals uh, from infiltrating the environment sector in Northern Ireland. So, I analyzed uh, structural and situational factors of the mobile legal dump. It's not only limited to the mobile legal dump, but rather a organized environmental crime in general in Northern Ireland. So on the side of structural factors, there is the neoliberal state and the sectarian party politics. And on the side of situational factors, there is lax planning and weak enforcement, and also paramilitaries and criminal gangs in Northern Ireland, and also in the island of Ireland. And then those uh, factors combined uh, lead Northern Ireland to institutional ecological blindness, which I would define, uh, you know, systematic failures in environmental governance and enforcement. And then that bring, uh, that, that cause environmental damages and crime, uh, which shows uh, human violence and on nature as well. So on the, 
uh, about the first factor, the neoliberal uh, state. I actually already mentioned about the neoliberal consensus uh, that was pursued already uh, in the Northern Ireland government uh, since the signing of the peace agreement. Uh, here, economy is uh, the economy is per perceived as something that is against the environment. Uh, here, as you can see, the growing reliance on cap private capital to finance public infrastructure uh, projects in Northern Ireland uh, is seen as emblematic, emblematic of the very particular direction that public policy came to the claim to take in the decades of signing of the Good Friday Agreement. So here. Although the, although the state is led by a power sharing government, which is consisted of uh, British and Irish political parties mainly, they actually came to a consensus. Like uh, for example, they granted a license to uh, build a golf course around the giant causeway, uh, which is recognized as, uh, I can't remember correctly, but which is recognized as UNESCO uh, cultural sites. So they actually have no problem with uh, doing those kind of projects, and also because the environment is uh, the environment is perceived as something, some kind of obstacles to economic growth. Environmental regulations are, are quite uh, weak and uh, quite loose in northern, particularly in Northern Ireland. But here, and the neoliberal such neoliberal agenda is pursued by not only one side of the. Uh, power sharing government in Northern Ireland, but it's actually uh, pursued by um, pursued based on the consensus. And uh, in terms of the power sharing government, the sectarian party politics is uh, some kind of a structural factor that make environmental regulations and enforcement weak. Because if one department is led by one party here at this moment, it's led by the Democratic Unionist Party, which is uh, quite supported by agricultural uh, stakeholders and also business, large businesses. They do not like, they don't like uh, stronger environmental regulations and they actually opposed to the climate change bill, a climate change bill that is uh, being debated in a parliament. So uh, if the if one party says no to, because uh, no, no, and if that party leads, uh, let's say Department of, Department of Environment, then other parties uh, do not usually challenge the party because it's kind of the logic of sectarian party politi politics. So while the Department of Environment is not working properly, uh, but there is actually no effective opposition, uh, opposition party to challenge that. So those are structural factors of illegal dumping or organized environmental crime in Northern Ireland. Um, here, it's situational. I'd like to focus on situational uh, factors of illegal dumping or environmental crime in Northern Ireland. So basically, against this backdrop, uh, the neoliberal consensus was pursued uh, within the sectarian party politics. Environmental governance has been uh, fragmented in Northern Ireland to a serious level. Uh, it's here we can see a figure, although it's, it has changed over time. But still, uh, such a planning, for example, planning is under the responsibility of the Department for Infrastructure, while environmental enforcement is under the guidance of the Department for a uh, Department of Environment. But actually, this Department of Environment was uh, integrated to uh, to the Department of Rural Affairs and Agriculture, which makes an environmental law enforcement agency. Uh, so-called game poacher, uh, poacher and gamekeeper. So the regulator, environment regulator, and the regulated committee, uh, community comes under one same department, which uh, brings about ineffective uh, enforcement and regulation. Um, so there has been a several report, uh, research and also governmental reports on uh, on the rise of organized environmental crime, particularly in waste in the waste sector. But uh, here we can see criminal gangs and paramilitaries could uh, could have uh, created profits by illegal dumping, especially in Northern Ireland, and then they transfer uh, waste waste from the south, the Republic the Republic of Ireland, to Northern Ireland. 
And then again, uh, these kind of profits because uh, landfill, especially landfill tax in Northern Ireland is lower than the South. And also uh, sentencing, although it has changed, the, the level of sentencing uh, remains quite low, uh, which cannot deter, uh, effectively deter uh, those criminals uh, to come to Northern Ireland. Uh, it's not only uh, uh, illegal dumping, but also fuel laundering and smuggling creates uh, water soil contamination and uh, all other uh, stuffs like uh, illegal transfer of uh, old tires uh, is also one kind of uh, waste crime in Northern Ireland that hasn't been uh, actually uh, tackled by the government effectively. So as you may know, Northern Ireland is kind of a hot issue uh, in, the, in the UK politics at this moment because of Brexit. So Northern Ireland and Ireland actually shares a land border. And as the UK left the EU, uh, the management of the Irish border is, 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 is a, is a uh, significant issue. Well, once, uh, once the EU uh, rules, environmental law and regulations uh, will not be applied to Northern Ireland. It, se it seems that, okay, it's two minutes left. It seems that uh, more challenges will come to Northern Ireland to prevent those criminals. Uh, so basically the land border will be still open uh, to some extent to guarantee kind of a kind of a free movement between the between two countries in the island of Ireland. But that means also paramilitary, dissident paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland and also uh, in collaboration with uh, other criminal gangs in the south and also north, in the north can cooperate to uh, create gains from illegal dumping, not only illegal dumping, but also other environmental crimes like uh, illegal trafficking and uh, trafficking of wildlife species. So, uh, it's just two minutes left, so I'd like to conclude my presentation. So uh, it's, I think, the ultimately the problem here is that uh, the peace, the post-conflict peace, has been designed to promote neoliberal economic growth, and also uh, that's why environmental regulations and law have been weak and also vulnerable to uh, criminals to infiltrate the environmental sector. So as an alternative framework, I'd like to suggest a, a sustainable peace that is resilient ecologically, socially, and politically resilient. One uh, should be pursued by not only by uh, local communities, but also by the state to uh, guarantee environmental protection as working uh, properly, working, uh, working properly, and also to protect nature and uh, local communities for their public health and also sustainable uh, economy. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Perfect. And my Perfect, present. thank you. Yeah, thank you very, uh, Yun Seo. I guess I, I, I got it right this time. Yeah. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Um, thank you for your presentation. So we're moving to Mexico, from Europe to Mexico. And uh, Meredith Gore has already joined us with the, her presentation. Uh, Meredith, uh, since you missed the beginning, each speaker has 15, 17 minutes, and we are collecting questions at the very end of uh, um, all presenters. Um, so please, uh, uh, we are looking forward to hearing about sea cucumbers. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. And I apologize for joining my, um, my co-presenters so late. Um, it's just been a crazy day, but this is the kind of um, this is what I live for, these kind of opportunities to engage um, the, the panel with the panelists and the uh, the folks that are that are in the um, in, in the zoom with us. So um, I would like to speak about um, sea cucumber trafficking in Mexico. And I would like to acknowledge my my co author, Dr. Abby Bennett, and this work has been funded by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And what we have been doing um, for about the past um, two years is engaging with local fishing communities at their invitation to try to bring um, new tools and um, kind of ways of thinking 
about this problem of sea cucumber trafficking. And we've been using um, place network investigations. And so it's been really exciting for me as an interdisciplinary scholar to have an opportunity to work with um, so many different kinds of, of disciplines. Um, I'm currently in the Department of Geographical Sciences at the University of Maryland, and I study um, illicit um, and illegal global environmental change. So without further ado, I will, I will start off by um, offering you a, a very, very elementary um, discussion of why sea cucumbers matter. Um, and so, you know, sea cucumbers are a legally traded fish um, in many, many parts of the world, um, and they pr they provide a lot of ecosystem services as well. Um, why do sea cucumbers matter in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, sea cucumbers are not that charismatic, but they are super important. They um, they essentially recycle nutrients as they eat and poop. Um, they are offering um, cleaner water. They help the the substrate. Um, of the ocean and the sand and their their nutrient recycling is really, really important for um, essentially cleaning up all the dead things that are in the kind of in in the shore area. Um, one thing that's really interesting is that through the process of um, recycling nutrients, they actually buffer ocean acidification. Um, and so one of the um, impacts from global climate change and rising sea temperatures is ocean acidification, which carries with it its own um, additional unintended outcomes. Sea cucumbers help to buffer ocean acidification, so they are part of the fight against climate change as well. Um, they also provide um, food for other animals, and so they, they contribute to the food web. And so sea cucumbers are important for humans, for human consumption and for trade, but they're also really, really important for ecosystems. And so I just want to recognize that um, when sea cucumbers are overfished, um, there are negative consequences for humans, but also the, the ocean ecosystem within which they live. So in the Gulf of Mexico, um, sea cucumber fishing really only started about 10 years ago. Um, and so uh, there are local people who have been fishing for octopus and grouper and lobster for, for a very long time. And these fish products are part of their their diet. Sea cucumbers are not. There is no local consumption of sea cucumber. Um, and so sea cucumber is entire, it's an export, it's an export industry. And so in that regard, um, a legal trade in sea cucumber offered fishing cooperatives and fishers an opportunity to essentially get more money um, and kind of broaden their, their diversify their, their fishing supplies. And so this was originally seen as an amazing situation. Um, as legal sea cucumber fishing um, kind of caught on, there was a, a boom. There were tons of people that came to fishing communities just to fish for sea cucumber. And so there was a lot of pressure, um, a lot of people um, and the two species that live in the Gulf of Mexico on the on the Yucatan Peninsula were were quickly um, suffering from illegal fishing. Um, and the implications of this illegal fishing are very widespread for the communities and the fish um, and has resulted in these <laughs> these fish being trafficked. Um, and so they're trafficked often, um, through the United States on their way to um, Hong Kong, on their way to Malaysia, on their way to Singapore, Thailand, um, many, many places in the world, and they are trafficked for a lot of money. Um, and so a lot of the interventions, the approaches that try to think about um, you know, helping to resolve this problem of sea cucumber trafficking often ask the question, you know, where does wildlife trafficking happen and, and who is involved, right? And so the idea is, you know, where is this happening in time and space? What are the flows? Who are the people that are involved? Um, you know, these crime syndicates. The idea is that by asking and answering these questions, we can devote our law enforcement responses. We can 
focus our policy responses. And so um, this idea of like where and who is a really common way of thinking about the problem. Um, and so when you see maps of sea cucumber trafficking, you often see arrows crossing a country. Um, there's not a lot of um, fine scale detail about this issue. Um, and so we know a little bit about where the plant and animal species trafficked from, where do they go, what are the routes, where are the flows. Um, we kind of have this information. Unfortunately, it is not resulting in um, the kind of meaningful change in the negative impacts of trafficking. And so one of the things that I've been trying to work on is bringing a new way of, of asking questions. Um, instead of like where and who, I've been trying to understand how. The idea is that by different and deeper understanding about how sea cucumber trafficking happens, maybe we can identify um, different solutions, different solution partners, um, and also thinking about ways to prevent sea you know, sea cucumber trafficking in the first place. Because once these animals are taken out of the ocean, it's, I mean, it's, it's over, right? So um, sometimes you can um, repatriate trafficked wildlife, but other times you can't. And so once it's done, it's done. So I've been asking how, how it happens. And what I would like to offer is um, a relatively novel idea that was born um, in urban cities in the United States um, to address homicide. And the idea was that you can look at, um, you know, high rates of a problem like homicide and, and you can take crime data and crime data tells you about the crime sites. And so you can understand where is it happening um and you can you know create a heat map essentially and so a lot of the times when you look at a crime map you see crime sites and this is this is good information but it's not the whole picture what we now understand is that this place these crime sites are part of a network and we need to be systematically investigating other places and spaces as well Okay, so what I would like to do is I would like to introduce the four C's, right? So beyond crime sites, we need to be looking at comfort spaces, corrupting spots, and convergent spaces, and the interaction of these places in space and time. So systematically, you can look at comfort spaces. Where do offenders go when they're not offending? Um, corrupting spots, where are new offenders kind of brought into the fold? Convergent spaces, where do where does sea cucumber crime or homicide overlap with other kinds of crime like burglary or um you know domestic violence or things like that and so in trying to understand um the four c's we can start to understand how crime sites are interacting within a broader network that enables crime to occur in the first place so what's happened in places like Cincinnati, Ohio, and Las Vegas, Nevada, is that by, by measuring and by measuring these four C's, understanding the interactions of these four C's, and then trying to understand which potential partners might be able to be engaged across all of these places, they've been able to experience a marked reduction in in crime, in homicide. And so we've been thinking about how do we adapt this to the problem of sea cucumber trafficking in Mexico? And so, you know, if you're just looking at crime sites, <laughs> this is essentially what you see. You see, this is somebody illegally fishing, right? It's open water. Somebody is underwater illegally fishing. Like, how are you supposed to intervene in this site? Um, maybe you see a fisher that's, um, you know, illegally fishing again. So now you see a boat that's anchored um, or you might see a couple of um, boats that are kind of tying together, um, you know, trying to share information about where the fish are. It's really um, hard to measure. It's hard to intervene. Um, and this is not really uh, a meaningful way of trying to prevent conservation crime. So what we've been doing is we've been um, engaging local people, um, the local fishers 
in trying to define the problem, describe the problem, and understand how the process of illegal sea cucumber fishing actually happens. And then we've been giving them the tools to start collecting data about the four C's. And so in this regard, it's essentially citizen science. Um, and so we have um, different perspectives of what sea cucumber fishing and trafficking looks like. So this is just part of the um, the the picture. Um, I can't show all of it because um, this is kind of real world data and I, I want to make sure that I'm um, being general enough to not endanger anybody. But when you look at some of these pictures, what some of these places, you can see that there are definitely things happening in the ocean. We would expect this. This is illegal fishing. But when you start to pan in, um, you can see that there's a lot of of the four C's that are happening on land. And so what happens when you start to dig in even a little bit closer? Well, you can see that there are hotspots on land, right? And so you can see that there are places and spaces that are disproportionately contributing to this crime place network. So one of the things that's been really interesting is that we then go, you know, in addition to using, um, you know, like GPS and and uh, data collection apps, we can then go in and do participatory mapping. And so we ask people, where are the A's? Where are the B's? Where are the C's? Where are the D's? Um, and so remember before that the the B's were the crime sites, A's were comfort spots. You know, and so you ask people based on your own lived experience. Um, where are the comfort spots? Where do um, sea illegal sea cucumbers fishers go when they're not illegally fishing? Um, and so we're able to combine all of this information and create a um, picture of the landscape that looks completely different. Um, and so, you know, this is essentially what we see. All of a sudden, we're able to see that illegal fishing is illegal sea cucumber fishing in this instance um, is not just an issue that's happening in the ocean. Now, maybe this seems tautological to the group here, but that's not always the way that conservation community or law enforcement authorities on the ground treat the problem or try to respond to the problem. And so what we see is that there's a way to delineate um area beyond fishing grounds there are community fishing grounds and then here are these place network interaction categories they're color coded comfort spaces corrupting spots convergence settings and crime sites we also ask people to label these sites as being like a high medium or low risk um, and so um this is uh this is one way that we're able to kind of get at the different the different landscape we're also able to look at where these um, places are within the community and who is there mm -hmm. so because of time um, i want to just offer that when you start to look at crime place networks you start to see different places where you can intervene um, you can also get a much more detailed understanding of how um, illegal sea cucumber trafficking and fishing overlaps with other kinds of um, uh, illegal fishing, um, illegal transportation, et cetera. So what does all this mean? Um, I guess what I hope I've convinced you of is that using these alternative methods, this place network investigation, it helps to change the data landscape. Um, and so we're now seeing that illegal fishing has touch points at sea and on land and in network places. Um, and this has been really important as we've started to understand the fact that the fishery has actually collapsed. And so we now have evidence that illegal fishing has resulted in the collapse of this particular fishery. But we've also been able to introduce new solutions to prevent illegal fishing before it actually happens. Um, we've been able to identify comfort spaces to intervene before fishing actually happens. We've also been able to engage new partners and new problem solvers like these um, fishing cooperatives in collecting data and engaging in um, data driven decision making to prevent the, um, the illegal activity. So with that, I will just say thank you um, for the opportunity to contribute and I'm really looking forward to a vibrant discussion. Um, thanks again. Um, and uh, that's it.
Awesome. Thank you, Meredith. I love your images and the network analysis that you did, your spatial approach to crime. It looked very, very impressive and definitely speaks of you as a very uh, careful scholar with creative ideas. I, I appreciate your concept of citizen science. I wasn't really much aware about it, but the way you presented it makes perfect sense. Um, I do have a couple of questions, but I would like to give a chance to our audience uh, to interact with the speakers, to get clarifications, raise uh, questions uh, or raise concerns. Uh, if any, I see the first questions coming for Meredith. Um, what sort of interventions at comfort spots are you referring to? Who engages in the activity and what does it consist of? Yeah, so that's really interesting. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, so what we found is that the bodegas are actually important comfort spaces, um, like a bar, right? And so what we've been trying to do is engage the bartenders and, um, you know, sometimes there are like food carts that like to hang out outside the bodegas, like at certain time of the day. Um, and so, or at night right so like the bars don't have food and so like people like patrons can go outside for food so essentially it's like you know can we engage bartenders and bar owners and these food vendors in trying to build awareness about illegal fishing alternatives to illegal fishing the consequences of illegal fishing um and then you know depending on where and at what time of day there might be different individuals who we could engage the other thing that we found is that there's been a pop-up economy of like airbnbs where women have been able to um essentially create like rooms in their house and um create restaurants in their homes to support the illegal fishers when they're in town and so um, you know, this has been this is a challenge, right? So that when the fishers are done fishing, they go back to their Airbnb and they they hang out. And so, you know, are these women able to be engaged in, you know, understanding that, you know, we want to support economic growth and this is like a cool way for innovation and, you know, entrepreneurship for these women, but is there a way to do it legally? Um, so, you know, those are two examples of these these comfort space comfort spots. Um, in other places, they're like sport, you know, like the basketball court or um, a church or a schoolyard. Um, and so these are places where it's a lot easier to like intervene and try to convince somebody to change their behavior as opposed to like the actual action of the illegal fishing. Um, so those are just a couple a couple examples. I hope it's um, somewhat illustrative. Perfect. Uh, I see here that Abigail wanted to answer that question. Abigail Davis, if uh, if that's correct. Abigail, are you here? Do you have anything to add? Um, I guess no. I'll just give it a second to make sure because I saw Abigail then like, oh, what's going on? This is a new tool for me, Q&A. So I'm, I'm exploring it um, uh, today. Oh, this is okay. I understand now. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions from the audience? If not, I have uh, a couple of question, uh, questions. The question for Willis, uh, who studied um, sandalwood uh, crimes. Um, I'm curious whether you experienced criminal organizations to be violent in any way. Sometimes when we think about environmental crimes, we, we see that violence is not very frequently used, which is not always the case. I'm not trying to draw any generalizations here, but based on your presentation, I just didn't see that those groups engaged in sandalwood trafficking would be particularly violent. And I'm curious if, if you've, you, you have tracked any cases of violence and how exactly does it manifest, manifest itself? Yeah, so thank you so much, Julia. Uh... Personally, no, but I, I, I've seen and read of instances where uh, people have been killed, uh, people who are thought to be snitching on the, on, especially on the government officers that, that, that are basically facilitating this, the, the trafficking process. Uh, most of these are normally armed government officers, the police, uh, the officers from the Kenya Wildlife Services, and the Kenya Forest Services. So uh, there are instances where uh, of, uh, members of the public have, have, have had have faced violence. 
but also uh, the traffickers themselves. Uh, in one of my interviews, uh, we, we we talked to one 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 government officer from the Kenya Forest Services who talked about uh, a plot uh, that that was that that was hatched to to eliminate several government officers who were thought to be you know being very stringent you know to prevent the trafficking of sandalwood. So uh, the, the traffickers themselves are, are basically ready to 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 kill and to eliminate uh, government officers that they think they cannot be able to bribe. So the, the, the element of violence features very, very prom prominently in, in, in these discussions because uh, uh, they, 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 the, the police uh, in one way protects the, the trafficking network and the police is armed, but also the, the, the traffickers are also uh, ready to go out of their way to, to basically eliminate any, anybody who stands in their way. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Phyllis. That uh, that uh, gives a very uh, careful answer to me. I appreciate this. We have a question from Sheldon. Actually, it's a combination of questions. Um, one goes to Ju Jun Sel and the other to Meredith. Uh, for, so for the Northern Ireland, the question is pretty much asking about the regulation and whether there are any gaps uh, in the laws which um, which facilitate harmful activities, namely waste trafficking. Uh, and then the question for Meredith is also about the regulatory uh, landscape. So the, uh, Sheldon is, uh, is wondering about enforcement gaps, regulatory and, in, or, and or enforcement gaps contributing to the situation uh, in a negative way, obviously. And I have uh, two more questions, so maybe you can you can consolidate your answer. One uh, to um, uh, Junsel, I was curious about the role of civil societies. I interpret your your presentation that you are not interested per se how criminal organizations operate, uh, paramilitaries and criminal organization, but your focus is more on the governance governance structure of the problem, right? So, and you show, showed us very different mechanisms for governance. And I'm just curious where civil society is in, in that context. And my question is about the civil society to Meredith as well. So as far as I understood from your talk, your methodology is pretty much that you go and ask local communities, something that Willis did in his present in his research. So you ask people for intelligence information. Um, and my question is how comfortable are people sharing this information? You mentioned Air, Airbnb um, businesses that women have started. So if they give those rooms, if they rent rooms to criminals engaged in traffic and how likely are they to speak to you about? And because obviously they have a financial interest in keeping on the A and B renting business. So um, I'm, I'm curious about the dangers and limitations of talking to communities. Thank you. Uh, we will probably get sta started with John Sale just because he was first and then Meredith, you'll have a chance to speak next. Uh, thank you everyone for their questions. So on the side of the regulatory gaps, uh, basically, when you see uh, abrupt criminals, you are uh, basically the pollute to pace principle is applied to them. But in Northern Ireland, the pollute to pace, the PPP isn't, hasn't been actually applied to environmental to crime. So basically criminals do not have to restore what they committed. And uh, actually also another, another aspect of uh, weak uh, regulation enforcement comes from planning. So basically like in the case of the mobile legal dump, uh, licensed waste waste processes could bury, uh, sh bury and shred, shred uh, waste, industrial or household, doesn't matter, they, they did it, uh, in sand and gravel pits. And those kind of gravel pits can be digged before they get a planning license. Actually, planning license application can be made after they started uh, those kind of sand and gravel pits in Northern Ireland. So basically you have, you get a license to process waste so you uh, deposit the waste and then you uh, find a place, a good place to bury that to save landfill tax. So uh, by illegal dumping, they uh, make profits from uh, from saving, mainly saving landfill tax and also probably commissions from uh, businesses to uh, to just deposit their waste on the behalf of them. And uh, 
On speaking of uh, civil, the role of civil society in this environmental governance, yes, I, I uh, at this presentation, I focused on the governal, governance arrangement and structures that were not uh, compatible with environmental protection, rather they're focusing on uh, a pathway of uh, criminals to commit environmental crime. So the civil society has been marginalized in the environmental governance. Uh, we usually say public participation is very uh, crucial component to you know to be participatory environmental governance and also sustainability but against this backdrop of sectarian party politics environmental governance has been uh, largely marginalized and there is actually no arrangement for public participation in environmental governance so like the case of the mobile little dump the ni government has finally established a stakeholders meeting where citizens can uh, can get involved but actually recently uh, the members of uh, the citizen members of that stakeholders meeting a group just walked out of the group because they thought they uh, lost public confidence in the government because the government says uh, everything uh, citizens uh, demand on the government and the government says well it's uh, there is a criminal uh, proceeding going on so we cannot give uh, we cannot provide you with information blah 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 and please do not share uh, inf the provide information with other citizens who couldn't join the stakeholders meeting, et cetera. So basically no representatives from the civil society are engaged in environmental governance. And uh, wide, in a wide way, uh, if the civil society is, represent is the representative, I don't know whether uh, it can be called civil society representative, but agricultural uh, stakeholders are well representative in environmental governance, but they are actually uh, kind of the regulated committee, community, sorry, not committee. But uh, so here, as I said, the regulator environment, there is an environmental protection agency, which is uh, led by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. So uh, once again, under the same department, there is the regulator going on and also the regulated community. Meredith? It's so interesting to think about how much the regulatory context matters for these different these different environmental crimes. Um, and I think it thanks so much, Shell, for that question. Um, the sea cucumber fishery is really interesting. There's actually really great fisheries regulations. There's great natural science. Um, there's a very active federal science agency that does a great job monitoring. Um, the local people are involved in um, in in like lots of really cool natural science. There's a little bit of a disconnect between the natural science and the policy in terms of jurisdictions and, and um, authorities. The enforcement gaps are really interesting. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's limited resources. And it's the fact that um, there's a lot of other maybe more pressing issues besides sea cucumber trafficking that some of the Mexican law enforcement authorities are, are coping with. Um, what's really interesting is that some of the fisher, fishers have started to engage some of the um, organized crime cartels to provide fishing protection. Um, and so I think that there's a whole issue associated with the law, law enforcement institution there that I think could be unpacked further. Um, and I think there's like lots to talk about there. In the interest of time, I'll just move to the next question, which is that, you know, this idea of the role of civil society. Um, you know, we were invited to work with these folks. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I kind of look at my role as providing technical, like technical assistance to local people in their decision making. And so, again, you know, science doesn't make decisions, decision makers make decisions. And so, um, because we are, we have been invited there and we have, you know, um, almost like a 10 year, but the, the team has a 10 year kind of history working with these folks. And this is, this is a problem that they perceive. This isn't like outsiders coming in saying you have a problem with sea cucumber trafficking. Um, they want to solve this issue. And so, you know, again, we don't ask who we ask how, so it's a combination of like established social science research methods with the community engagement um, and the, the the strong role of civil society um, that I think enables this project to 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 kind of be I would venture to say successful. Um, of course, then the fishery collapsed, so like that happened. So now we have to see what happens beyond that. Um, so yeah, really interesting. 
Um, I see there's another question that um, Yulia, you've asked me to respond to. Um, I'm just going to read it for myself out loud. Sorry, everyone. Um, can you reflect on using this space network mapping method to understand the spatial distribution of multiple environmental crimes at once? What would be the challenges, for example? I see great opportunities to understand how various crimes converge across all four C spaces and how these spaces are used differently by different actors. Yes, totally. Um, this is like a really new way of thinking about um, like crime, right? And if you remember that 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 like, crime in place and time, right? And so we we often don't think about like the mobility of offenders, the mobility of victims. A lot of the times we tend to think about like crime as being like static in place and time. And so I think what this PNI offers is a little bit more dynamic um, thinking. I also think there's like an amazing opportunity to potentially use like remote sensing data um, and start to train computers to look at images and find patterns in images. Like when you have four buildings and three streets um, and a school and a bar and a bodega, do you want to kick that over to a human brain to start saying, is this a place where we might see crime in the future, given patterns in space and given what we know ab about crime place network interaction. So yeah, I think there's like lots of opportunity to think about how environmental crimes um, scale, right? So you could think about, you know, um, could you think about sea cucumber fishing in Yucatan and illegal logging in the Monarch Biosphere Reserve, which is more towards, um, I don't know, but it's like a different part of Mexico. I, I apologize for not knowing my geography better. Um, so could we look at like, could we look at that? Could we look at sea cucumber trafficking in Mexico and Thailand in the Ottoman Sea, for example? Um, I'm actually going to do that. That's why those examples came up there. But yeah, I think there's a lot of really cool things that can be done with this like 4C stuff. And we're just getting started. Um, it's kind of like, you know, once you start to think about a changed data landscape, you just like start learning and like you get really hungry to like learn more things. Um, and, you know, I would just say, you know, from my perspective, that's a contribution that science can make to the to the to the problem. So just something to think about. Awesome question. Yeah, methodology is always um, is always um, a tricky but very promising and rewarding area, right, for investing time. And technology has uh, has had such a huge leap forward in recent years. I'm catching up with so many things, and I say I have, you know, my list of study the technology is so long. But I think I think the images you showed are excellent, and um, satellite imagery is highly promising for environmental crimes. I personally just had a book published on illegal mining. We didn't cover satellite images too much, but. This is something uh, I would like to do next, also for illegal logging, maybe for waste trafficking, for waste uh, dumping zones, right? Satellite imagery is next. So uh, I'm really looking forward to more availability for science and, and scholars to, to be able to use uh, satellite images. Uh, I guess we don't have any more questions and we have only five minutes left. Are there any final remarks the speakers would like to, to, to give, to make? No? I guess that it's been a very long day. <laughs> um, so uh, it's time to close this panel. Thank you very much for staying with us. Um, environmental crimes uh, are popular, they're serious, they should be treated uh, with proper due care and proper attention. And this, this is what we attempted to do tonight or uh, to, uh, in the morning, depending where you are. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you everybody and have a very, um, Good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the OC24 podcast. For more talks, have a look at the podcast feed on whichever platform you use. There are loads more to listen to. Video versions of these talks are also available on the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime YouTube channel. If you would like to share these talks around, we ask that you use the hashtag OC24 and let us know what you think. 
The 24-hour conference on global organised crime is brought to you by the European Consortium of Political Research Standing Group on Organised Crime, the Centre for Information and Research on Organised Crime, the International Association for the Study of Organised Crime and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. For more information, head over to oc24.globalinitiative.net. This has been the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Thanks for listening.